So hopefully you're convinced that AI can transform the world and make it safer, healthier, and happier. And uh, if you're not Google or Facebook, you're probably also wondering, you know, how do you win in the space? How do you succeed? And so in this talk, I'm going to be distilling some of the learnings that we at Nirvana have had by engaging with both large uh, and small customers in the last couple of years. Uh, so companies like uh, Monsanto uh, in the agriculture space, uh, Blue River, which is a startup in precision agriculture, uh, Manulife is a large financial company, uh, Paradigm is an oil and gas uh, software company. So across a bunch of different domains, um, you know, how do you succeed in the space? So uh, one tip is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you can use an existing model. Uh, the field of AI and deep learning have been unusually open, so you get a lot of publicly available models. And through this process of transfer learning that you've been hearing about this morning, you can take one of these publicly available models and apply them to your data. And so on our platform, you can get models for video activity detection, object localization, sentiment analysis, speech recognition, and others. Uh, another important point is, oh, and here are a couple of examples actually of uh, some of these models. On the left is an image segmentation model that's commonly used for autonomous driving applications. And on the right is a video activity recognition model uh, originally from Facebook that can detect one of 100 different uh, categories of actions. And it can get pretty specific, as you can make out. So, when you're going about using one of these models, uh, often it's not enough just to use the pre-trained model that you're getting or a pre-trained API that you're getting from an online service. You often need to fine tune it on your own data. And the example here is that if you're trying to detect different kinds of tumors, you don't want an API that's just been trained on classifying cats versus dogs. Uh, similarly, if you're building a medical transcription system, you don't want something that was just trained on a voicemail data set. And this is another thing we hear about a lot. Uh, you know, talent is really tight. Um, all the deep learning talent is getting absorbed by the big companies in the space. So how do you, as uh, an enterprise customer or a startup, go about building your talent in the space? Uh, so there are a couple of options. Uh, one is you can use professional services from companies like ours or others. And uh, you can also go about training your staff. Uh, there's a lot of talent in adjacent areas to deep learning, so in traditional machine learning or in areas like computational neuroscience or computational physics, um, or even just in software engineering. There's a lot of really talented software engineers who are really interested in AI and deep learning and with the right kind of training, they can pick up what's needed to be successful. Uh, so we recommend hiring and training these individuals. Another important consideration with any technology, and this is true for deep learning also, is evaluating the degree of lock-in that you're getting into. So um, for example, if you choose to go with a cloud service, choosing one cloud service might make it difficult to use a competing cloud service. And although deep learning has been very open, a lot of academics are getting into deep learning and they're bringing this very open spirit with publishing papers and code and frameworks, uh, there are still some things that are proprietary. Uh, so data being one of the biggest ones that's been talked about this morning. And so you want to evaluate uh, what kind of lock-in you're getting into as you're choosing these different technologies and how are the owners of the underlying technologies incentivized as you're making these decisions. Um, so these days, uh, there's a big trend towards using public clouds and you know, data is pretty secure on a lot of these public cloud offerings. But many companies are on the uh, longer, costlier uh, five-step program towards the public cloud. So, if you're in one of these companies, uh, do have an on-prem appliance option as you're uh, building up your deep learning stack. Um, or you can go straight to using a cloud service and skip these intermediate steps. 
so the next thing is, uh, you know, initially, uh, typically in the deep learning life cycle, you're starting off doing uh, initial small scale explorations, but then at some point, you want to be able to scale up to a much larger data set. And uh, if you can do, the, do that scale up on the same service with minimal incremental effort, then you save your data science team a lot of time. So as you're evaluating your options, uh, choose a scalable cloud service where you can do this entire life cycle in a similar kind of um, environment. So deep learning, as I think some of the talks have alluded to and you've probably heard, uh, the training process can take weeks or even months in some cases. And so if you have access to technology that can give you a big speed advantage, uh, that can give you a huge competitive edge um, over the competition in whatever space you're in. So this is perhaps what we're best known for. Uh, Nirvana is known for achieving ludicrous speeds on GPUs as well as on our upcoming Nirvana engine processor. And other companies like Google have also announced deep learning specific processors. So the analogy that I like here a lot is that of uh, GPUs with respect to graphics. So 25 years ago, uh, before GPU started out, uh, if you were trying to render a photorealistic scene, it would take you a huge cluster of CPUs to do that. Whereas with the advent of GPUs, you can now play photorealistic video games on your mobile phone. And so what we foresee is that, and so here's an example actually from the video game Wolfenstein, where 25 years ago, uh, you'd see you'd be playing with that graphic on the left, whereas with the most recent versions, uh, you, can see, you can play with this really photorealistic kind of uh, avatar. And so what we envision is similarly with deep learning specific processors, uh, you could have a proliferation of devices that are embedded with intelligence and are learning in real time. Another really important consideration is planning your data strategy. So you could have the fastest processor in the world, and if you don't have it continuously fed with data, then that's gonna be a huge bottleneck and you could experience significant slowdowns. So you wanna think a lot about the upstream processes as you're getting the data over to the processor that you're using. So for example, getting the data over from the object store to the local disk where you're doing the processing, uh, getting uh, th that data from the disk to the uh, host memory, and then often you're also doing these on-the-fly data augmentations, and then copying the augmented data from host to device memory, and from device memory to device registers, so you want all of these steps to be happening in parallel in multi-threaded processes so that you're keeping the device continuously fed. And in addition to that, you want to have support for all the um, different file formats that you expect to encounter and being able to do the load, uh, transform, and the augmentations for those formats as well. And finally, once you're happy with your trained model, you'll want to have a strategy around deploying that in the field. So uh, depending on whether you're deploying on an embedded device or on a website, uh, there are very different power, memory, accuracy, and connectivity trade-offs. So uh, plan ahead for what those are going to look like. And so obviously I'm from Nirvana, so Nirvana has you covered for all these things that I mentioned. Uh, we have a fully featured uh, software framework, uh, which is pretty interoperable with many of the other frameworks that are out there, um, as well as a cloud service and platform, and our upcoming engine and uh, appliance. And so our goal really is to uh, make AI more accessible, and through that, make the world safer, healthier, and happier. And just finally, giving some examples of where our customers have used our platform and applied uh, deep learning for the use cases. Uh, so customers have used us in healthcare for detecting tumors in images, in precision agriculture, for counting plants in fields, 
uh, in oil and gas for finding oil-rich regions from seismic data, in automotive use cases for improving in-car speech recognition, and also for building a time series search engine for financial applications, and recently in uh, proteomic uh, use cases for engineering better organisms using deep learning. Thanks.